Welcome to the Poetry Box Live and Happy New Year. I'm Sean Avenango Sanders and I'll be your host for tonight's show. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with us, my husband Robert and I run a small booty press here in Portland, uh, Oregon, known as the Poetry Box. Uh, in addition to publishing our annual anthology, The Poming Pigeon, we also specialize in full length poetry collections and chapbooks. And since we started in 2015, we have published over 80 poetry books. So you might say we really like poetry and we really enjoy working with poets from all walks of life. The Poetry Box Live series is our way of supporting our talented authors to help them connect to their audience. And we have three fabulous poets lined up for you today. We have Kathy Kane from Portland, Oregon, Pasquale Trozolo from Kansas City, and Marsha Lochran from New York. So let's get started with our first reader. Poet and visual artist Kathy Kane is the author of A Shape of Sky, which is due to be released on Tuesday. Her previous books include Bee Dance, which was, was released in 2019, and Empty Space Places You from Finishing Line Press. Her honors include the K. Snow Paul Ann Peterson Award for Poetry, the Edwin Markham Prize for Poetry, and various awards from the Oregon Poetry Association. Her poetry has appeared in Reed Magazine, The Poming Pigeon, Verse Weavers, and Voice Catcher. Kathy taught in the public schools for over 30 years she is the lucky wife of a very sweet man and the mother of two fine sons. Please welcome Kathy Kane. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be here today reading with Marcia and Pasquale. I want to thank you uh, both, Sean and Robert, for hosting the event and especially, especially for publishing my two most recent books. Uh, it's been a delight to work with the Poetry Box Press. And of course, I want to thank everyone for being here. I get very touched. Um, all right, so first I'll just read two poems from my older book, which is called Bee Dance. How's that? Can you see it? <clears throat> Uh, for those of you who might have the book, uh, the first poem is on page 15. And it's called, it's a, a memory of childhood innocence. California buzz. I miss the hum of golden pollinators, thick honeybee in yellow acacia. Blossom fuzz dusting, the tree swings mellow trance. The Dutch door to the playhouse, Honeysuckle sunned out against a white fence. Beyond, the small plot of orange and lemon trees. Hours heavy with scent, low enough to pluck. Even under that rock, the black widow hanging, red hourglass warning, you could skirt her with luck. On page 42, I thought this next poem might be appropriate for our more uh, intense communal experience during this last year of the virtual world. Uh, and there's a little word play here between bite, B-I-T-E and B-Y-T-E. The poem is called Hunger. The bright path of green curiosity hangs ripe with fruit on your screen's shifting display. Light's weight entices, and you reach for an image as you step into this wondrous way. You enter a binary garden, a lush quartz maze, open tiny etched latches on simple red logic gates. What of this abundance have you yet to taste? Will it nourish or offend? With gravitas, you take another bite. Eat this garden's lovely light. And now I'm going to read from A Shape of Sky, my most recent book. Uh, I'll read first the opening poem of the collection on page 13. 
It's entitled, How Easily. Like a sieve, he says to her, your brain is like a sieve. And she thinks to herself, it's true. Then she glances above at the big blue sky and notes how easily the geese pass through. Page 32. This poem is about my obsession, my passion for art, um, both visual and the tactile experience. And I was inspired by the American artist Kiki Smith, uh, who makes strange, often disturbing, um, but magical work. It's titled Red. Value, the relative lightness or darkness of a color, or a compulsion. I imagine one red tulip upright with a bent green leaf. Place it in Red Riding Hood's hand. Then render the entire scene only in black lines, crosshatched on white. I engrave for nightmare. Yet, even when told this way, her face, her red cape, remain as dappled light skipping through my frightful fairy tale. Red still startles dark, marks the hard craving of my wolf heart. This one's a little different tenor um, emotionally. It's on page 54, entitled Pillow Book. I have spent the day with my dying friend and in my mind, she is so alive. But now I am here with you, my love. Our bodies intertwine, arms, thighs, ribs, permeable among the sheets, my skin translucent. Afternoon light, pearly gray shines through the window her skin translucent among the fresh white sheets. Spent, you have softened and relaxed back into your creature self, separate. Her dark wine tongue slouches back into her throat. She is separate. You snore heavily with open mouth. Open mouth, she breathes the deep and noisy rattle of death. We are warm with the work of love. She is warm with the work of dying. Light catches the edge of your fine collarbone and shoulder. Her neck, her shoulders, beautiful in form, grow whiter, more permeable among the fresh white sheets. We are almost gone from each other. Translucent arms, thighs, ribs, souls. Our bodies intertwine. We love, we are gone. Page 58, rain. You will be replaced, you do not matter. Those rock hard words remain, but time has bathed them in a curtain of rain, hung from blue clouds, heavy like a mother's breast, relaxed in delicate release. A curtain easing the dark mountain horizon into textured mist. A fine pale rain that rushes out wide over a flat land strewn with boulders seen from afar as harmony, a reminder there is more to know than our final loss. This wet landscape of me, an exquisite rubble, random, innocent, now unbound, dripping, open, like those clear ancient spaces in the loose blue run rain.
Page 71, New York City, NYC, the pilgrimage. I first saw those grave markers packed so tight when the bus I rode rounded the corner. Nothing like the grassy open cemeteries of Los Angeles. All those bodies must have been laid to rest, not flat, but upright, massed together, like when they patiently waited to enter Yankee Stadium, or when bravely striding across the subway platforms, they endured rush hour crowds down under. And how they climbed the stairs massed together up to the landing, all of them now a band of angels pouring out into the light. Hey, JD, too. For this poem, um, I was inspired by the famous British poet, David Hockney, uh, whom I'm wild about. And I just wanted to say in a playful way uh, how much fun I have when I'm drawing and painting. Uh, it's a very safe place for me. Uh, Hockney made a painting entitled Self-Portrait with Red Braces. Braces being a British term for suspenders. My poem is called Self-Portrait with Red Suspenders after David Hockney. I dress in his dark shirt, dull yellow pants and snap that red elastic. Will you suspend your disbelief? In the studio, I push the brush clear through to sky blue, the scent of orange exuberance. I putter, painting pops of green epiphanies, frolic with the absurd, the daft, give heavy sanity across the room a mere glance. A touch of ekphrastic rose, fuchsia euphoria, red suspenders. Reckless folly, implausible, or is it? A tender madness color, thought caught, devil danced. Oh, how beauty braces us. Page 83, On Larch Mountain. I feel like a poet perplexed, amused, playfully examining classical views. As wrapped in the woolly blanket square, I stare through this telescope from my canvas chair. The chair with its unfolded legs placed down, its dark framed back pointing up, though earthbound, to the stars and all the connecting lines in between that tether down in emptiness unseen. Dot to dot pictures that tell stories like Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, mother and child side by side, thrown like a crown to the sky. I'm an absence, a moth, a mere blue thing, a force like a constellation, an interval filled with what is held Stories, night, this bright cold. Cheerful, forgiving the puzzle, the unreadable chart of heaven's arc. I look in, focus my heart, a polished mirror that gathers light and whispers it back to the curved side of night. I'll read two more poems, first on page 86. <clears throat> in 1976, the artist James Terrell, some of you may be, be familiar with him, uh, bought an actual cinder cone in Arizona. It's called Roden Crater. And he began transforming it uh, for much of his life into an earthworks art installation and a naked eye observatory. The poem is called The Shape of Sky. Pretty out there in the terror of scale to see a shape of sky, 
say through a telescope. Jupiter and the four Galilean moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto, mere glints in the eye of an artist's enchantment. I'd like to believe I could walk down into that crater through the artist's caves and tunnels, overcome my fear of under the ground, go deep into his order, his other, in order at the end of his maze to rise amazed and see anew the magic shapes of color. Light set off against its absence to increase our black appetite, our hunger, for say a blue like the stained glass windows set in the thick stone of Saint Chapelle. I'm afraid of airplanes, but on a good night, I can really fly. Not speedy, but far. A dream cruise, circling, then pulling out wide in big space, quiet space, turning out on a soar. So I say to myself, stay with the crater, its empty bowl, its access to shape and sky. Stay with the crater, fly off its rim. And the last one's a short one on page 88. When? When I notify you of my desire to be back in the life I loved, it will be subtle and quick. Perhaps October's gold turn of aspen leaf or a snow-capped mountain peak, suddenly pink. It might be the cold apogee of white splash against green sea, or maybe a flash of red under the black wing of that bird flying low over marshland. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. That was gorgeous. You know, I find your poetry to be very comforting, especially in these troubling times. And I just have to thank you for reminding all of us that when the world seems too much, we can turn to beauty in ourselves and nature and artwork. And I love that, that last line from your self-portrait with red suspenders. Oh, how beauty braces us. And that pretty much says it all. So thank you so much for this. Our next featured poet is Pasquale Trozzolo, author of Before the Distance, which happened to be one of our top five selling chapbooks this year. So congratulations, Pasquale, for that. Pasquale is an entrepreneur and founder of Trozolo Communications Group, one of the leading advertising and public relations firms in the Midwest. In addition to building his business, he also spent time as a race car driver and grad school professor. Now, with too much time on his hands, he continues to complicate his life by living out as many retirement cliches as possible. He's up to the peas. Before the pandemic, he only shared his poems with a handful of close friends. Since sheltering at home, he has begun to share what he calls the virus poems. Please welcome Pasquale Trozzolo. Well, thank you, Sean. And thanks to each of you for spending some time with us this evening. Um, it, it's an honor to share the Zoom stage with Marsha and Kathy. Kathy, your words were beautiful. Um, it's a, you made my task a little more difficult having to follow you, so thanks. Um, tonight I'm going to read to you uh, a series of poems from my chapbook, um, which of course is available from thepoetrybox.com if you haven't got it yet. Um, but as Sean mentioned, these are my virus poems. And uh, the first one I'm going to read to you is called, uh, it's a short poem called Reputation. And I wrote Reputation when the pandemic was really just winding up, you know, back when it was still sort of fun. Um, and uh, I found myself, like a lot of you, spending a lot of time on social media. Um, and so I wrote Reputation. 
I haven't been this nice to people since ever. Admittedly, I'm mostly calling, texting, Facebooking, emailing people I like, mostly. And Facebook, come on, do I really like it or just being nice? If this virus doesn't kill me, it's going to ruin my respectability. Well, after a week or two of sheltering in place, it, I became a bit more reflective. I'm usually pretty optimistic about my past, but I began to wonder, could I have been better? Could I have contended more? What did I miss? So I sat down and wrote this little poem called Contender. Whose smile did I ignore? What cry did I not hear? Whose hand did I not take? What kiss did never tell? What love did we not make? How much is never known? What love we let escape? What new could have been? What wonder could have flowed? Well, you know, once you start down that rabbit hole of wonder, it's hard to stop. Um, and so I sort of got into that whatever happened to state of mind. And I wrote this poem called, Do You? Remember me? Forgotten yet there, cemented in your past. Are you alive and well? Do you remember that song, our song, Precious and Few? I remember you and our moments, quiet and blue like the sky. Did you find love? Did you find your way home? Do you remember? Well, one morning, another few weeks in, I woke up in a sort of why state of mind. You know, like all of us, like, why is this happening? When, you know, why, why, why? Um, but I realized that I'd been spending most of my life chasing the question why, and perhaps it was the wrong question. So I wrote the poem called About Why. I don't like why. It's so demanding and discouraging. Why should why matter so much? When is so much better? Why is the question, when is the answer? Like when we kiss, not why we might. Like when we are born, not why we die. Like when we write, not why we try. So then it was a beautiful spring, early spring morning, and I walked outside in the backyard and wandered around and saw what I hoped would be, uh, I hoped to gain a feeling of new beginnings that comes with early spring. Um, but when I took out my notebook and the pencil hit the page, I wanted to write about winter. And so I wrote this poem called Before the Distance, which became the title of the chapbook. Where did you go? It was winter before the distance. Why is a lonely spring already here? Some may not miss you, but me, I do. Winter's end is my favorite time, like a lost lover resisting, warming, and cool again, unpredictable, full of surprise, false starts and wild blooms, all knuckleballs and chances. I want winter again, before the distance, with a true winter's end, without the distance, just the wonder and glory of a good-natured fight. Where did you go, Winter? Where? Now this next one, it still makes me a bit weepy. And I know, I know my wife is nervous right now. Um, I, I wrote this one for my granddaughter when her high school graduation was postponed and the losses seemed to pile on for all of us but especially for the class of 2020. Um, so I, I wrote this short expression of loss. It's simply called <clears throat> graduation for Sophia. Although she did not ask, questions hang in the air, <clears throat> like fog clouding what comes next, waiting patiently to consume. Nothing is clear, only mist. Will we see gowns? Will caps fly? Will we remain suspended 
unable to escape a distant stage are only set? Although she did not ask, questions remain. Where are my flowers? Will there be music? When is my party? This next one is I think my attempt at the time to get rid of my fear. Um, I thought, man, I'll, I'll just pour it onto the page here and I won't be afraid anymore. Uh, it didn't work, uh, but this poem is called On Sale. I'm scared, worried all the time. I hide it well sometimes. I worry about how much I worry publicly now. Worry and I are well acquainted, even friends. My biggest fear, not worrying. That's terror. It feels right scared. I was made for it. Perhaps I can capitalize, you know, sell it. Would you buy my fear? Well, COVID felt and still does like it just falls from the sky, unrelenting, creating a storm of danger. And so I wrote this poem titled Slip. Sleet falls, driven to assault me. Expert precision astounds, piles my path with slip, pelts me in a storm of dangerous possibilities. I'm right to be afraid. Where is my snow? Soft and free, beauty in each flake. Come snow, take my sleet away. Stop this freezing arrest. Where is my snow, pure fluff? Where? Well, you remember when it was gonna be over by Easter or Memorial Day or the 4th of July or Thanksgiving or Christmas or New Year's Eve? This one's simply called Mind Games. In my mind, I still have places to go people to meet, hands to hold, vacations. Promise of normal chaos tempts me so, with reasons to believe lonely passes, melts this trance that infects so virulently. Are these facts to trust or just too deep in wine that brings hope? Are these footsteps for me to follow or fear? Are we now coming back to life or is this our true decline? Well, one morning, sitting on the deck, I realized that being stuck at home might not be so bad. This is about a morning I was not lonely. It's called Cue the Day. Is that any way to say good morning? That pose, that smile, that touch, that kiss? What did I do to deserve this? Am I still dreaming? Now I'm gonna read several poems that are not part of the book. They're a little more recent work. Um, this next one I wrote this past fall, sitting under a tree with the leaves starting to fall and, and um, observing their, the look and sound of what fall meant. Um, and this one's called Fallen. I think it might be about my mother. You know that sound, that light scrape of leaf once fallen? Like an old transistor radio switched on, it crackles. Passing along the street with grace and a gentle disturbance, traveling lightly, it changes direction so easily. Does it know its destination? Does it know it's already dead? Yet still it travels and crackles and seduces me. I want to follow, but can't keep up catching only fragments. Does this fallen leaf now out of sight know I miss her? I remember how it moved, sharp, crisp, and stirring. And that crackle, to hear it again, I cry. This next one um, is written out of my envy for painters. Um, I think it would be great to be stuck at home with paint and brushes and canvas and to be able to just cover up so much. Um, I think if I were a painter, I'd be an abstract expressionist, so I could 
pretend not to care when anybody thinks of my work. Um, this one's called Portrait. Already it's been a day, 10 a.m. and I can murder a gin and tonic. She started on me real early, red first, smearing, rubbing, practically pouring it over me. Then scarcely without pause, she started on the green. Green, yes, a gin and tonic would be nice if she could just get my mouth right and the bottle and a lime. That's what the green must be for, lime. Look at those strokes of hers. She's on fire this morning, breathless. Wait, why am I naked and fat? I thought she loved me, but now I see she's still angry. How many years, how much paint will it take before she gets over it? It was just that one time and it was abstract. It didn't mean anything, it was abstract. This one's a little bit about loneliness and worry. No matter what our station is in life, we all worry and we all get lonely. This one's titled, My Hawk. Does the hawk mind flying alone wondering, will they wait at the nest or fly on without him? Are clouds his only company? Even as he flies, he cries, silently so as to fool. He's higher now, but not less worried, just more practiced. Should he admit his state? Is this it? This next one is a true story, which I can't say about all my poems. Um, it's about uh, an experience on vacation. It happened many years ago, but the memories are still quite vivid. It's called Vacation Girl. Doors open, she enters, captures me like a riptide I can't escape. Rescue is what I need. Bronzed was the first word that came to mind, though breathless I could not speak. The second word I can't put down for fear of arrest. Singed, I edge closer. She's right there. I can smell her, see her glisten. As if to invent possibilities, she speaks first, whispers one word, now. I take her hand. We walk towards the elevator, enter, doors close. We embrace, grabbing, pulling, sweating, craving. We both know this is headed for unexplored pleasure, days of it. This feels dangerous and delicious. We can barely contain our desire. Then we heard them, almost forgotten if only for the moment. Mom, I'm hungry. Dad, can we go back to the pool? Eyes meet, a silent message. Later, honey, later. This next short one, is um, inspired by a friend of mine that I, uh, we used to meet for lunch when we were able to meet for lunch. Um, and uh, it was always, it's always interesting uh, with him. This one's called Old Man and the Sea. Like something out of a sailor's dream, she rushes by without so much as a glance. Despite Herculean efforts, she's too much. My eyes follow like a construction worker. As she walks, my heart beats in rhythm to her feet. Her summer colored hair waves in sync with her hands, silk hands. My thoughts perch on her like frost on a rose. Without warning, she turns then speaks. Can I get you another drink? Shame, old man, shame. Well, this past year has been really something. Uh, in the middle of the greatest health crisis in over a hundred years, um, there was the terrible things we all witnessed around the social justice movement. And yet it offered us hope that maybe something really would change. Um, and um, some of my writing, like I'm sure almost every writer turned to a bit of protest. Um, and um, this is a, a poem I write, I wrote about living here in, in the Midwest, in the heartland, um, where we sometimes feel a bit too protected from things. And it's called When in Kansas. As if nothing changed, I stand in the sun's warmth, feeling the touch of gentle winds, 
seeing coneflowers bloom across the fields, hearing meadowlarks sing in romantic ritual on my Kansas land, acres of distance protects me, safe in middle America. My prayers and I live complicit in this state, at home with silence for too long. Now a distant voice scrapes the morning sunshine into shards of anxiety while injustice hides among the wheat and whispers drown truth grasping for breath and I can't breathe freely on the prairie any longer. Questions like gathering clouds fill my sky and beg courage. When will we no longer look away? When will we treasure life and liberty for all? When will we be uninfected from this virus of injustice? When will we recover from our safety? When will we ever be free? When will justice for all find Kansas? When will we choose truth over delusions? When in Kansas, when? Well, I'm gonna close with this next short one. I wanna to say to Sean, thanks again for all you do for all of us. Uh, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, this, this final poem I think reflects our current state um, and it's called On Hold. My skin is splattered with gray. Outside the sun warms only half my face. I am faded, no colors remain. Cold, I shake, like an ancient bridge rattled by a heavy load. Will I come apart? Will you hold me? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pasquale. Um, that was moving and funny and everything a reading should be. So good job on your first reading. And um, I loved it when you said, I think this one's about my mother. And then you had that, that ending line that was just killer. And then somebody literally joined the room and I let them in. And then you said, why am I naked? Wait, why am I naked? <laughs> and I thought the timing of that was just perfect. So whoever that was, I hope you enjoyed that, the rest of the poem. <laughs> And uh, I really wish this was a live reading because I could see everybody laughing. I could see all, all the little thumbs up and applause coming up. And uh, it was Robert and I were both sitting here cracking up. So uh, it was a lot of fun. So thanks for bringing some fun to the pandemic. Well done. So our final uh, feature tonight is Marsha Luckren. Marsha is the author of My Mother Never Died Before, which took second place in the Poetry Chapbook Prize for 2020. Contest judge Amy Miller said about her manuscript, My Mother Never Died Before is a joyful read, full of surprises. The poet shows her versatility and variety while bringing a welcome dose of humor to this collection, which is hard to pull off in a collection about death. Marsha's work has appeared in the New York Times, Verdad, Spoon River Poetry Review, and elsewhere. Her first chapbook, Still Life with Weather, won the 2016 Water Sedge Poetry Chapbook Prize. She reads her work in various bars, bookstores, and black box theaters in New York City and the Catskills, and is a regular at the Irish American Writers and Artists Salons. Marsha is a nurse practitioner and lives in Queens, New York. It is my pleasure to welcome Marsha Luckren. Phone calls. There's a specific time of day, not a time exactly, more like a pause, after the second cup of coffee, before I get dressed and go to work. I could be paying the phone bill or folding the laundry. I feel like calling my mother. Nothing urgent, more like I have nothing to say. And she was always the best at listening to nothing. All the nothings that happen in a day. As it happens today, I have a story she would have liked to hear about my friend 
who was biking home up Madison Avenue, crossed 41st Street, and woke up surrounded by EMTs. No idea what happened, no memory of the people who helped. He lay on a stretcher in the ER for hours, immobilized in a neck brace, listening to the man on the left withdrawing from heroin and the man on the right who had mixed up his meds, both of them frequent flyers, neither of them visible to my friend who couldn't move his head other than 12 staples in his skull and an overwhelming desire to nap, he's okay. What I wanted to tell my mother was how I laughed out loud at the image of my friend in a neck brace because neck braces are funny. Just to see what she would say. Am I a bad person to laugh at this story? Laugh out loud in relief? I think she'd be just as relieved. She likes this friend and so pleased at further evidence of miracles. The fact that I'm not sad, I can't tell this story to my mother. Another more minor miracle. It's hard to laugh and be sad at the same time, like trying to keep your eyes open when you sneeze not sad for that brief moment. And how can anyone be sad when my friend didn't die there at 41st in Madison, didn't ruin everybody's Thanksgiving and can call me up and tell me all about it. I hope I'm not muted. It's like reading in a library, you have no idea. Literally, it's complete silence. Uh, Sean, thank you. Poetry Box Live. It's like the 1920s radio shows. I just love it. It's so great. My fellow readers, Kathy and Pasquale, um, uh, I can't wait for the question and answer when this is over and we can actually find out how to pronounce Oregon because Kathy's from Oregon, Oregon, and Sean's from Oregon, Poetry Box is Oregon. And then we can just all feel better because everybody knows how to say Kansas. Pasquale's from Kansas. And thanks for everybody for coming and tuning in this medium. Um, my next poem, it's from my book, uh, my Mother Never Died Before, available from the poetrybox.com, also my website. You can go to the chat and order it if you don't have a copy. This is called Differences of Opinion. If there is a heaven, which my mother said there wasn't, she is there arguing with her mother about the color of the kitchen. If there is a heaven, you get to decorate it the way you want. And in our family, kitchens are yellow, but yellow is a wide road. Betsy, too bright, says my grandmother. It's not a New York taxi. Grand's already joined the country club, started a local chapter of Colonial Dames, put my mother's name on every list. You'll get in, she says, her grand. Kitchens are for sit-down breakfast, matching saucers, egg cups, milk in a bone china jug. Her yellow, a watery winter sunlight, squinty with the memory of one. My mother, butter and popcorn, a three-year-old's drawing of the sun, dandelions, daffodils. Odd, they are fighting about color. They both had macular degeneration the last 10 years of their lives. Faces, edges, gone. Only color remained. Color kept them going. They had color in common. Because it is heaven and harmony required, they take turns. 
clambering up the ladder in angelic white overalls splattered with a rainbow of corn, sunflower, lemon, butterscotch, bumblebee, chamomile, and chardonnay, painting and repainting each other's walls. Um, I thought we'd take a break from my mother and copy Pasquale. I think everybody's been writing about the pandemic. Even if you're not a writer, you've been writing about the pandemic. So I have a pandemic poem. Um, this is called Late Pandemic, and it was from January 2nd, 2021, which feels like a long time ago, I know, but it was actually less than a week. Late Pandemic. A block away feels like spring. Grackles grackling, sparrows caught sunbathing on the wrought iron rails of the front gate. Here by the river, the wind won't let us forget it's January, people, not out of the woods yet. A clean, fresh wind, sun at its back, like an Irish prayer for the new year. On the way home, a stranger gives me the weather report and my neighbors show off their pandemic baby. She must be eight months old by now, unafraid of my masked face, cooing over the stroller. The only full featured faces she's known, her parents and her own. Um, before I close, uh, I will do the, the title poem from my mother never died before available at poetryfox.com. I just want to point out the beautiful cover. The illustration was done by Jojo Sanders of Sebastopol, California, who happens to be one of my very many talented nieces and nephews. She's my niece, um, genius. I don't know if you can see it, but it's gorgeous, gorgeous. You can buy it just for the cover. Um, I want to thank Amy Miller, who's a brilliant poet and has a really fun blog. She was the judge for our chapbook, uh, for the chapbook contest and a generous one. And thank you, Sean, of course, for being our DJ and our guiding spirit. Um, and uh, thank you everybody for putting up with this weird, quiet, room. I'm just so glad you're all here. All right, you ready? My mother never died before. It's called this because it's what I kept thinking after she died. Like, I don't know, what are we supposed to do? Are you call a priest? You call it? It was very confusing. It was a very confusing time. So uh, this is what I kept thinking. My mother never died before. Anyway, it's been three weeks since my mother died. And I'm starting to forget, not her, to forget each crazy mini moment since. How the EMT got on the phone with me. It's what we all want, our own bed, our own pajamas. How the next day, Kevin from the funeral home pronounced pajamas the way they do in the Midwest. She'll be dressed in a new set of pajamas. He is from Ohio, although a different part than my mother. Just being from Ohio felt like a miracle to us as we stood in the parlor of Gromer's sons, which incidentally did Presidents Taft, Roosevelt, Roosevelt, JFK, then I stopped listening because we walked into a room full of coffins, thoughtfully laid out like new cars, angled to imagine an exciting journey in comfort and safety, some open to white quilted interiors, some closed to accentuate a glossy finish, 
I kept saying, ugh, 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 as we passed through, which was probably rude. But Kevin never blinked. He is a professional. And when my brother and I squabbled, you could tell Kevin had a sister somewhere, maybe in Ohio, he would squabble with two. Walking towards the urn display, my father spied a tasteful wooden box holding tissues. She'd love that one, he said. Even Kevin laughed. It made looking at the urns easy. I was surprised how simple. I'd imagined a Gresham vase with curvatures and animals in blue cavorting, not these plain wooden containers bigger than a toaster, smaller than a bread box. We picked one and wandered out, making small talk about the renovations. I want to remember the scraps of things, what people say, offerings, a patchwork quilt to comfort us, moments of incredulity. This is happening. My mother has died. The event I have been dreading and preparing for, imagining the possibility, possibly since I was born. Here is how it felt to get the news. Like the boat I had been sailing, thudded into a dock. Like I stepped onto the pier and held the stillness of land after a long time afloat, my sea legs stopped rocking. Maybe because the cord that had been gently, persistently tugging me along, pulling me over the ocean, the cord that yanked me into the world has been cut. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, Marsha, now I'm crying. I spent most of your reading laughing and, uh, and I wanted to say thank God for Kevin at the funeral home and um, I could really relate to the yellow poem. Um, when mo we had a yellow kitchen when I was growing up and my mom, uh, we were gonna paint the house a new shade of yellow. And I came home from school and she was really upset because she kept screaming that the house looked like um, the yellow of the stripe that goes down the highway. <laughs> kind of like that school bus orange, so that, you know? And uh, so that yellow poem gets me every time, but, um, Gosh, what that was that was beautiful, beautiful. And something that we all dread and have to go through. And I haven't been through it yet, but I went through it with my dad and that was hard enough. So thank you for having the courage to write that. And um, yeah, thank you very much, Marsha. That was that was fantastic. And and thank you to all three of our fantastic poets tonight. Uh, please support their wonderful work, buy their books. Uh, find them on their websites, on their read their blogs. They're they're all just fabulous poets. So, bravo to all of you, and thank you to all of you for joining us for our another edition of the Poetry Box Live. Um, as poets and authors have been impacted, you know, by the closure of bookstores and vent reading venues across the country, it means the world to us that you would join us here on Zoom to celebrate their poetry. Uh, next month, our show will be on Saturday, February 13th at 4 p.m. Pacific. And our featured poets will all be from the West Coast. We'll have Carolyn Martin, Deborah Meltbet, and C.W. Emerson, our third place winner from the chapbook contest. And to keep up to date on upcoming shows, new releases, submission opportunities, please subscribe to our newsletter by going to thepoetrybox.com where you'll find a sign up form at the bottom of each web page. And by the way, we will be opening on February 1st for our fourth annual chat book contest. And you can find all the details on our website. It will be judged this year by the amazing poet, Annie Lightheart. Thanks again for joining us today. I'm going to unmute everyone so you can ask questions and chat with the poets. 
Uh, have a wonderful rest of your weekend and we'll see you next month. Oh, hi, Robert. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, Robert. Thanks, Robert. Beautiful. This was a great reading, everyone. Yeah, yeah. Oregon. Oregon. That's <laughs> Oregon. I get Oregon. It. I can't get it. Why do I think it's Oregon? Is that totally wrong? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I came from New Jersey and I it took me months to learn how to say that word, but you gotta practice. Is it Oregon? <laughs> <laughs> it's just Oregon. 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 Or again, Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> You're fabulous. Or, or as we say in as we say in Oregon, Oregon. <laughs> 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 <laughs>